Good afternoon and salamu alaikum. Welcome to everyone who's joining us today. Uh, this is part of our ongoing uh, series, if you want to say. It's a series of conversation uh, that started uh, when COVID hit and we had to come out of the canvas. Uh, these conversations began to be the way we continue to have links to the broader community. And also some of us were unable to travel uh, to conferences, to gatherings, to workshops. Uh, so, but it was very important for us to continue to highlight and engage in the scholarship and to see what people are doing uh, in scholarship, broadly speaking. Uh, today, really, it's, it's a, uh, for me, it's, an, it's a pleasure and a, I'm delighted to have uh, not a, only an academic colleague, but a dear friend uh, that has been part of the, really the circle and the family of the Islamophobia uh, work that have taken place in Berkeley. He's been with us uh, for a number of years. And I'm really delighted to uh, have the real hard book in my hand uh, that is from uh, Professor uh, Robert Bishara, who's a professor of psychology and humanities at Northern New Mexico College, USA, and the director of the Critical Psychology Certificate Program at the Global, uh, at the Global Center for Advanced Studies in the Ireland, USA program. Uh, but he is known to us as again as a, uh, a key contributor to the field of Islamophobia, psychoanalysis, psychology, and uh, really, it's uh, I'm happy to have him with me uh, at this conversation. So let's spring. Welcome, uh, Robert. It's good to have you uh, with us today, and to see that you are uh, joining us at this particular time. So how are you doing? Sorry. I'm doing well. Salam, everyone, and uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bazian, for inviting me. Um, and uh, I just want to begin by expressing my deep gratitude for your support uh, over the years. I've been coming to, I've been attending and presenting at the Islamophobia Studies Conference since at least 2016. So that's like five years. And I've been there four times. Um, and, uh, you know, you were a member of my dissertation committee. And we can talk about that a little bit because it's related to this book and how, uh, you know, I developed the idea for it, uh, inspired by you in big part. So I'm appreciative of uh, being in conversation with you and I thank everyone who's listening and uh, hopefully uh, it will be, uh, you know, some, some people will gain something out of this. Great. So again, you're putting Freud and Said together. So yeah. To start this conversation, uh, how did they sure. get together? Uh, in your book, and what is the linkages in terms of their both their scholarship and your own scholarship? Absolutely. So uh, this actually started in my dissertation, which uh, turned into my first book, Decolonial Psychoanalysis Towards Critical Islamophobia Studies. Uh, and in the first book, I actually started exploring uh, the theoretical links between Edward Said and Sigmund Freud. Uh, particularly in terms of Freud's influence on Said uh, in Orientalism. Um, so when you read that, you you actually were very interested to learn more about it. And um, uh, and so you kind of planted the seed. I, I couldn't really expand on that um, in that first book. So I decided to write a sequel to Decolonial Psychoanalysis, which is Freud and Said. Uh, Contrapuntal Psychoanalysis as Liberation Praxis. And in that sequel, uh, in this book that you just shared uh, with us, uh, I really explored the theoretical links between uh, Freud and Said, particularly in terms of how Freud uh, influenced Said. Uh, and this is very clear in his second book, uh, which is called Beginnings. Mm -hmm. um, so in that second book, which is not as famous as his third book, Orientalism, but in the second book, um, which is the you know in the second chapter of my book, I, I write about it. Uh, Edward Said pretty much uh, writes extensively about, uh, in particular, uh, Freud's um, probably most important book, which is the Interpretation of Dreams. And uh, his point is that Freud um, is fascinating, uh, not only as a scientist that invents this field called psychoanalysis. Uh, 
which is his intention basically with that book, uh, The Interpretation of Dreams. But uh, he's also fascinating as a writer, as a modern writer who authors this field through his writing style. Mm. And so in The Interpretation of Dreams, not only do we see Freud analyzing his dreams and the dreams of his patients, but we also kind of experience the book itself and the way it's structured as a dream. So in a way, through the writing style, we uh, experience what it's like to uh, unconsciously dream because uh, a dream for Freud uh, has to do with an unconscious wish that's disguised or distorted. And this is why we need to interpret it to understand uh, what's going on, really. So I, um, basically, um, the writing style of Freud influenced uh, Edward Said in Orientalism something that hasn't been really explored. And then uh, many ideas from uh, psychoanalysis, uh, in particular, um, Freud's distinction between uh, latent dream thoughts and manifest dream content. So that language, you see it very clearly in Orientalism when he, uh, when Said talks about and writes about um, latent Orientalism versus uh, manifest Orientalism. And you and your own mm. work, Dr. Bazian, of course, write about it in terms of Islamophobia. Mm. Uh, so I can talk more about that, but that's kind of um, the initial connection is going back to the second book, Beginnings. Well, maybe we could make the link, let's say, between uh, Freud's work on Beginnings and then Edward Said in terms of Orientalism and maybe lay the groundwork for you know, the subconscious in relations to uh, Freud's and then moving into latent Orientalism and how we can stitch the scholarship, uh, especially, and then I'll, I'm going to jump into the post-colonial part, but... Sure, sure. Well, so for basically the theory for Freud is that when we dream, um, which is always, it's a great way to encounter the unconscious, basically, right? Um, so it's not the only way, but it's one of the main ways in psychoanalysis. Another key way, of course, is free association in the clinic where and the patient basically speaks freely whatever is on their mind. And so uh, the, the theory is that the latent dream uh, uh, thoughts are basically like words or signifiers uh, in the unconscious of the person dreaming. And there's a process in the dream called dream work, which basically transforms those latent dream thoughts or these words and signifiers that are unconscious into manifest dream content, which for Freud basically are images. And so when someone uh, talks about a dream that they had, they usually describe the dream in terms of images that they've experienced. So a psychoanalyst listening to this is interested not in the images, but actually in the words or signifiers that are behind uh, the images or sustaining those images. And so that's the whole point of interpretation. It's kind of to reverse the process of dream work and go back to that latent dream thoughts. So how does it work in terms of Orientalism? So we can think of Orientalism, which is basically um, how Europeans um, represent, write about, think about, you know, quote unquote, the Orient, uh, typically in uh, stereotypical ways. Uh, so we can talk about uh, the Orientalist work, uh, working like this dream work. So basically, we can uh, think of Orientalism as a European dream or fantasy about the Orient, right? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, what Said is doing through textual criticism, right, as opposed to uh, psychoanalysis in the clinic, is to not be distracted by the images produced by Orientalism, but to actually try to understand what are the key words or signifiers that those images uh, imply. And this is basically what the, the analysis entails. So you can see that the method of dream interpretation influenced Said's uh, method of textual criticism. Uh, but I claim in the book that Said represses Freud in Orientalism. And I say that uh, because he's referenced, Freud is referenced in Orientalism exactly three times. And yet, uh, his influence is quite visible, uh, especially with that distinction between latent and manifest Orientalism. So I thought, I thought that was really odd. And I had to really think about that deeply and, and try to analyze why that is the case. And we can get into that if you want. Uh, but basically, uh, I argue that uh, Said returns to Freud by the end of his life, 
uh, particularly in his last book, Freud and the Non-European, which mm. was the talk that he gave at the Freud Museum in London. And that talk uh, concerns uh, Freud's last book, which is Moses and Monotheism. So it's very interesting. There's kind of a cycle. He kind of begins with him in beginnings, uh, kind of um, uses his ideas, but represses him in Orientalism and then returns to him full scale at the end of his life. And of course, there are some similarities between the two figures, because both of them uh, are key figures in the 20th century that uh, found very important fields, you know, uh, psychoanalysis, post-colonialism, but also both of them kind of lived in this ex exilic marginality, to use the term from Edward Said, right? And mm -hmm. so, of course, uh, Freud was a Jew that lived in an anti-Semitic uh, Viennese uh, milieu. Uh, Edward Said, of course, was living in exile in the U.S. as a Palestinian. Um, both of them died from cancer, so another interesting uh, connection. Um, and so... I think there's something uh, in Freud that appeals uh, to Said and also informs a little bit uh, how he thinks about not only subjectivity, but also politics. Well, maybe you should take us through the uh, Freud psychoanalysis uh, and uh, built into uh, Freud and the non-European and then jumping into mm -hmm. Edward Said and see if you could make that bridge in your work. Yeah, so I think... I think it has to do with the tension uh, in Orientalism in terms of his use of Foucault, his reliance on Foucault. And of course, it's important to mention here the recent revelation about Foucault, you know, being a pedophile um, uh, who um, Not slept only him, with... but there's a number of other French, you know, yeah. philosophers. And I think in here, again, especially as they deal with the uh, global south, with the Muslim subject, those issues in there are, you know, have a long history to it. Uh, Absolutely. But there's a recent revelation that he slept with uh, uh, Arab, uh, yeah, Tunisian, yeah. Tunisian children. Uh, and so it's quite disturbing. And I think it, uh, it should um, definitely, it's something that we should stop and think about. But in any case, uh, Said always had a kind of uh, conflicted relationship with Foucault. So he liked his idea of discourse and discursive formation because it helped him understand on Orientalism as a discourse, but he thought it was also kind of a limited uh, way because uh, for Foucault, the, the the subject is just an effect of discourse. So basically, the subject is irrelevant uh, in a sense uh, for Foucault, and and Said disagreed with this even in Orientalism. So he writes about that distinction, and so I think this is why psychoanalysis appeals to him because it provides us with a strong theory. Uh, of subjectivity, particularly this question of the unconscious, right? Uh, and so that tension is there theoretically in Orientalism, and eventually over time, he ends up abandoning, of course, uh, Foucault by the 80s. And, um, you know, he famously um, said in an interview that Foucault was not only a theorist of power, he was also a scribe of power. Mm -hmm. So he wrote all, all this stuff about power, but he didn't really. Um, give us um, a good understanding of how to resist power. And so uh, he ended up basically abandoning Foucault and completely siding with Fanon uh, and other, um, you know, decolonial um, theorists and practitioners uh, such as Samir Amin, mm -hmm. CLR James, uh, Amr Abdul Malik, uh, and what have you. And so so this is a, a key point. So why do, he returns to Freud uh, at the end of his career uh, particularly this uh, late text from uh, from uh, Freud, which concerns, uh, you know, Moses, uh, you know, the founder of Judaism. And basically, uh, Freud argues, and of course, uh, this is uh, somewhat of a controversial text, uh, but uh, basically Freud argues that Moses was influenced by uh, Echnetin, mm -hmm. who is considered the, the, the first founder of a monotheistic religion with this with this uh, atonism or the worship of the sun not as an object but as a symbol of a uh, source of life and so uh, freud argues that uh, a lot of the principles from the ancient egyptian religion uh, were basically passed on uh, into judaism through moses and one of those principles is the principle of mat m a a t hmm. principle of truth and justice um, and so basically the paradox uh, of Moses and monotheism for Said, uh, 
is that basically Moses uh, was an Egyptian and yet uh, he is the founder of Judaism, right? So, so basically, um, Said argues that uh, this is interesting because here is the founder of Judaism being basically a non-Jew, right, an Egyptian. And so that's why he thinks about Freud being a non-European, and we can think about Said being a non-American, right? And so um, this question of how subjectivity could be founded in non-identity. And there's something liberating about that because for Said, politically speaking, um, he sees that there's a potential there in terms of not uh, you know, being identified uh, in such a way with a certain identity without realizing that actually a lot of identities could be based in non-identities. And that that's what makes them uh, more complex when you trace them back to their origins, right? Um, so that's something that for Said, he thinks about in terms of the, of course, uh, Israeli-Palestine conflict, uh, uh, this notion of, you know, the the Egyptianness of of Moses, right? Um, so, so that's basically kind of a, a rough outline uh, for those three body chapters: beginnings, Orientalism, and Freud and the non-European. Now, you make in your work or your your work in. Uh, in your thesis, as well as in this work, you try to make a new ground in relations to the study of Islamophobia. Yes. And maybe you could speak about, because your entry into a new field that looks at Islamophobia through uh, the psychoanalysis, through the whole psychology and so on, because yes. for a considerable period of time, Islamophobia has been just to decipher what the politicians are saying. You know, so mm -hmm. you say, here's some uh, bad words that the media are saying. Or here's what Trump said. Uh, but you're taking your work really in a, both building on Freud and uh, Edward Said and entering into a new field. So I would say yourself, maybe also Dr. Rania Awad, are entering into or bringing a new field into the study of Islamophobia. So maybe you could yeah. ask at least both your previous work and now uh, how this deliberate move to the study of Islamophobia from your vantage point? Okay, so that's a great question. So for me, the the point of interest for me was to explain theoretically the link between, uh, you know, the war and terror discourse and Islamophobia. I mean, everyone imp had this feeling that they're connected, but I didn't feel like it was theoretically elaborated. And so that's what I took it upon myself to understand the theoretical link. And so in my work, especially in decolonial psychoanalysis, I write about what I call uh, the ideology of counterterrorism, Islamophobia, Islamophilia. It's a mouthful, but basically by talking about it as an ideology, uh, I see that the war on terror discourse, uh, which basically informs practices of counterterrorism, uh, that discourse is sustained by what I call the Islamophobia, Islamophilia fantasy. So that's the link between the two. Like the discourse is sustained by that fantasy. And the problem with that discourse uh, is that it's a binary one. Uh, so uh, it situates uh, subjects in terms of terrorists or counter terrorists. So you don't have any other options, right? Mm. And so, the, of course, uh, the famous example of that is when Bush said, either you're with us or you're with the terrorists that's the best example of that so um so what i interviewed uh, 19 u.s muslims uh not only to learn about their experiences with islamophobia and document those accounts but also and and more importantly i was interested in how they resisted mm. okay and so ultimately i showed that um u.s muslims resist islamophobia which is the whole ideology but just to make it easier, I refer to it just as Islamophobia. Uh, and they resist it in two main ways, uh, through knowledge or critical knowledge in particular, uh, basically rejecting uh, dominant hegemonic uh, understandings about them. Uh, and so you can say also Orientalist accounts, mm -hmm. right, uh, and representations. So that's one form of resistance through knowledge. And the second one is through their own being by existing i mean there's a famous saying even from palestine uh, that exemplifies the practice of sumud uh, 
mm-hmm. uh, or steadfastness, uh, which is um, to exist is to resist, mm-hmm. right? Because ultimately, what does the colonizer want? They want the colonized to cease existing, right? So but for the colonized to exist in a colonial world, that is a form of resistance. So I call that ontic resistance because it's resistance through being. By, you know, of course, it's, it, it, it has a toll on the health of U.S. Muslims, on their psyche, but it's an important form of resistance to uh, basically occupy space and time, right, uh, in these hostile environments. Mm. Right. And so not being afraid, not hiding, being yourself in public. And of course, uh, there's that's very powerful. And so that's those are the two forms of resistance. And what I show in my work is that basically there are two implicit positions that are we can call them negative because they're hidden. Uh, So we have to talk about them in the negative, but we can also think about them positively. And those are being a not terrorist mm. and being a not counter terrorist mm. right so you don't have to just be terrorist either a terrorist, terrorist or i think yeah you can be a not terrorist so uh you're rejecting uh that identification and you're also rejecting identified identifying with counter terrorism so it's called not counter terrorism right mm. and um we can uh i group the two together and sometimes i call those two negative positions positively as anti-terrorism as kind of an alternative uh to that language of counter-terrorism and basically when i talk about counter-terrorism i put counter in in parentheses so it's counter in parentheses terrorism because counter-terrorism oftentimes can be a form of terrorism a form of state terrorism right um in the way uh you know it oppresses uh and ends up killing many civilians. Uh, and so um, in my position, I, I reject uh, all forms of terrorism, and that's why I call it anti-terrorism, right? Mm. So it doesn't matter if it's terrorism or counter-terrorism. So that's kind of what I try to explore. And uh, what I do with the second book, Freud and Said, is basically I expand this analysis uh, by contextualizing it within what I call the apparatus of racialized capitalism mm-hmm. to try to kind of ground my analysis in a material way. Uh, because in when way, I talk about... In which way, like, to analyze it in material ways, maybe gives yeah. like an example uh, of that. Well, uh, in terms of how the, you know, oppression and violence works uh, through these hierarchies um, that lead to the intersection of racism, sexism, and class struggle. And so what I call, you know, what's called racial capitalism, but basically capitalism has always been racial because it's been founded on, you know, colonization uh, of indigenous people, but also, of course, the enslavement of African bodies and their over exploitation. And so I try to, that's the material analysis to mm-hmm. to think about it in terms of the political economy uh, and not just in terms of ideology, because sometimes when you talk about ideology, people think it's just ideas. But it's important that uh, people understand that it's not just about ideas. As you mentioned earlier, it's not just about the media, but it's actually about an economic system that's mm-hmm. oppressive. Uh, and, and so that's what I try to do with, with Freud and Said is situated within that uh, apparatus. So the apparatus looks at the ideology that has the discourse and the fantasy, but also has that material dimension that has to do with um, how oppressive and violent capitalism is how hierarchical it is and how it situates people in a zone of being and in a zone of non-being right yeah now maybe i could uh, ask and this is something that you could tell me whether you want to delve into it or not but it sure. seems that the the rising tide of right wing nationalism and white supremacy and so on is projecting itself as being the victim of this uh, critique you know, they have been demonizing and throwing so much on Edward Said, uh, blaming him for all the ills. How do you navigate and understand this dynamics that is taking place? Yeah, so, <laughs> well, uh, I, I mean, I identify as a radical, so I'm, I'm both critical of 
conservatives, uh, right wing, but I'm also critical of liberals. Oh, no, that'd be but... equal opportunity. We're in the same, <laughs> we're in the same. Right. So, um, and, and, and so that's why I use the terms Islamophobia, Islamophilia in decolonial psychoanalysis for that specific reason, because the Islamophobia piece tends to be associated with a conservative attitude towards Islam and Muslims, which is basically... Uh, and by the way, because the common, you know, since you mentioned right wing, the common right wing attitude um, to a term like Islamophobia is they think that, oh, this is against freedom of speech. You cannot criticize Islam. This is usually their counter argument. And let me tell you this when, you know, I've seen hundreds of people respond to the cover of my book, Decolonial Psychoanalysis, in a very negative way. And I'm talking about European liberal mm -hmm. people, just because it has the term Islamophobia in the title. Mm -hmm. They haven't read the book and they don't want to read the book. They just see that it has psychoanalysis and it has Islamophobia. And for them, that's just a turn off. So they wouldn't even consider looking at my arguments or, or reading it. So this is what we're dealing with is and this is not something that's just a right-wing phenomenon. This is even among liberals. But uh, for them, uh, it could be manifesting as Islamophobia, but oftentimes it manifests as Islamophilia, right? Which is, um, you know, I love what you're doing, but, you know, you should be more like R Rumi and be more in that direction. Uh, you know, I think I'm fine with Sufis, but every other Muslim, I don't know, uh, in that kind of, or kind of, the, you know, Bill Clinton's uh, famous saying, uh, Muslims, we love you, but you need to help us with this fight against the war on terror, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's always situating uh, Muslims in relation to uh, terrorism, whether they like it or not. And so that kind of... Um, positioning, whether it's positive or negative, whether it's, you know, regardless of the intention, is problematic, right? And so this is why uh, when I talk about um, uh, that the, the third option beyond this is what I talk about is learned ignorance. Hmm. And a lot of people find that confusing, you know. Uh, but it's based on a very simple idea. It kind of actually goes back to Socrates, this idea of Socrates saying, I know that I know nothing. I mean, Socrates was known to annoy people and ask them a lot of questions and they keep talking and then he would be basically show that they don't know anything. And then they would be like, well, do you know about this? And he's like, no, I don't. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the attitude of learned ignorance is knowing that human beings are limited. They cannot know everything. And, um, mm. but you know, you can also be anti-racist and still and not know about Islam, but still be anti-racist and not fall into these traps of Islamophobia and Islamophilia. So I'm just saying this because sometimes liberals think that to fight Islamophobia, they have to go in the direction of Islamophilia. But that could be very uncomfortable for Muslims and weird, honestly. Right. Yeah. Um, so basically, you need to deal with uh, Muslims as normal people. And and that's why I talk about mundane Muslims. Uh, uh, completely uh, unrelated to this war on terror discourse. And that's the challenge, is how to to do that when this discourse is saturating everything, right? To the extent that it's saturating our own consciousness, not only that, but our unconscious. And so that's how, and I do this experiment, by the way, in my class, uh, uh, I would ask my students, what do you think of when you hear the word Muslim? And they're afraid to answer. Mm. Right, they're afraid to answer because they're thinking of something negative, negative associations, and that's how propaganda works. I show that propaganda is about the repetition and co-location of signifiers. So mm -hmm. you you keep repeating signifiers related to Islam and Muslimness in the same context of terrorism a lot, then people automatically associate them unconsciously, right? So that's the challenge is how to think outside of that framework altogether. And that's what I try to do with my work is to challenge us to think completely outside of that. Well, also, if we could extend the phenomena of uh, Muslims internalizing Islamophobia as well, which is you get to the sense of the good Muslim, bad Muslim, and the good Muslim is in essence becomes the person that really internalizes Islamophobia and begins to construct uh, identity constructs based on it. You mentioned uh, that I like Rumi and why you're not like Rumi. Right? Right. So that 
in essence, is an attempt to try to craft one type of Muslim, uh, but also Absolutely. produces a, a response from some Muslims that, in essence, begin to develop an antagonistic relationship to Rumi, and in essence, also gets their own conflict identity that doesn't really have a foundation to build upon. Absolutely. I mean, in what I show in my work, this is a like major finding in decolonial psychoanalysis, is that all of us internalize Islamophobia. Even, you know, I mean, some of us fight it, like you and me uh, and others, but we still internalize it because we're exposed to it on a daily basis. So, and that's the unconscious element. So how the unconscious works, uh, because, I mean, it's not a conscious decision. If you're being exposed to all these negative associations all the time, you internalize Islamophobia automatically. And that's the problem, is that it becomes this unconscious um, uh, framework informing everything that we do. And so the work that we have to do, and this is why psychoanalysis is important for me, the work that we have to do is at the level of the unconscious, not just at the level of consciousness, right? Given that we're vulnerable and exposed to all these negative associations. So what are we going to do about it? And so we have to kind of think critically about that dimension of, uh, because internalization, by the way, that concept comes from psychoanalysis, which, you know, really uh, speaks well to this idea of something being outside and uh, we internalize it. So that's exactly how the unconscious works. The unconscious uh, works on the basis of internalizing things from the outside. Uh, what we're exposed to, discourses uh, that we are exposed to, uh, things that we hear, and things that we read, things that we see, right? Um, and so uh, to, to, to completely challenge that uh, takes uh, an understanding of the unconscious and, uh, and not just fighting this at a conscious level. And I think that's the, the, the real challenge. Now, you mentioned, or your book is also attempting to have a liberation praxis. Mm -hmm. So what does this concept mean, uh, both for you as well as in terms of as a practitioner? So what does a, a liberation praxis mean? That's a great question. So first of all, I distinguish between liberation and freedom uh, in the sense that freedom tends to be an individualistic value. I mean, not everyone understands it as such, but uh, that tends to be um, the kind of liberal approach to freedom. My freedom versus your freedom, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but liberation implies collective liberation, which implies uh, social responsibility, meaning the famous saying that no one is free un unless everyone is free, mm. right? And so um, my understanding of liberation really is founded upon many thinkers, but uh, one of them is uh, Paulo Freire, mm -hmm. uh, who famously wrote the Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And, um, you know, he talks about liberation uh, being what is natural. Uh, it, it's a natural human tendency. Humans want to be free. This is the direction that they go into. But then, um, then you have dehumanization and people, you know, uh, structuring societies in hierarchical ways and oppressing and being violent and all of that. And so the question of liberation specifically from his perspective has to do uh, with, um, well, the humanization of all, because his point is when, when oppressors oppress, they're also dehumanizing themselves, mm. right? So not only, you know, so when Nazis treated um, Jews the way they did, uh, they were also dehumanizing themselves because they were treating other humans this way, right? And so this is, and so we can see this today with racism, anti-black racism, right? Or, uh, you know, any, any form of uh, racism or oppression that exists in society. It ultimately is dehumanizing for both parties. So for Freire, uh, the point is that the oppressed, since they know, the, know oppression firsthand, right? They're the best people that know about oppression because of their experience with it. They should be the ones leading uh, the way towards collective liberation. But that means, because sometimes when people hear this, they think, especially, um, you know, uh, people who are associated with uh, col colonizers or descendants of colonizers, they think that we're talking about the oppressed 
replacing uh, uh, the oppressors mm -hmm. like a cycle. But that's not what Freire talks about. He talks about the oppressed leading the way toward collective liberation of all, including the oppressors, right? And so uh, when I think about psychoanalysis, and especially in relation to the hierarchies that exist in societies that lead to oppression and violence, Basically, my argument is that psychoanalysis is situated in the zone of being, uh, which is a zone that ultimately um, supports oppression and violence, whether directly or indirectly. And so psychoanalysis and psychoanalysts in particular, whether theorists or clinicians, mm -hmm. have to really think about um, their relationship to um, this problem. And they can be neutral about it because psychoanalysis is not a contextual. It exists in a context in a historical moment and and so it's either going to help us uh, fight oppression and reduce it and eliminate it or not and so uh, when i talk about decolonial psychoanalysis in my first book i situate that in the zone of non-being so this is basically work that's done being done by people who are uh, either currently oppressed or descendants of people who were colonized and enslaved right so this is the work being done in the area um so it's the work being done by indigenous uh, folks, blacks, uh, people in the global south, Palestinians, right? Uh, poor people, um, women, etc. Right? Um, and so uh, that's when I talk about liberation praxis, is really trying to think uh, of of a psychoanalysis um, that is non-hierarchical mm -hmm. and that ultimately leads to the liberation of all and using those insights to think about this politically but ultimately liberation is a process it's not a thing it's not um, it's not a destination what does it lead to this is the big question mark right i'm utopian so i dream of a society that's non-hierarchical mm. um i'm not ashamed to say this um uh, there was a whether this society can exist one day or not I, i'm not sure but we know that historically societies like that did exist you know so i don't see why we can't move in that direction uh and so um the the praxis is to move in that direction and to to be oriented towards uh you know more equality and more egalitarianism and liberation for all uh we're talking to with robert bishara freud and saeed Make sure to pick up the book, uh, get on Amazon. I highly recommend uh, Robert's work. Uh, this is where really the, the work of some scholars that uh, you know, might not get uh, the New York Times to do a review, but what we need is to push this scholarship and make sure that people pick the book and uh, promote it, uh, put it in the classroom, uh, put it as part of the reading list as for faculty. Uh, this is very important, and you will see that I will promote uh, some books that I find to be very critical, especially in the field of Islamophobia studies. Uh, this is a new field and uh, major contributions that are taking place as we speak. Now, in the book, you, you deal with uh, uh, Saeed and his treatment on dealing with culture, right? Mm -hmm. And post-colonial analysis has a lot to do with culture. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe we could speak of cultural, cultural productions, the art, and so on, as Absolutely. a major depository of the, of, the, of the psyche of a community or a society. Right? Yeah, so absolutely. So, how, uh, both how yeah. do you deal with Saeed and how do you move in the direction of his contribution? Yeah, so obviously a good example here is Culture and Imperialism, which is sequel, his sequel to Orientalism that came out in 1993. Um, in that book, basically, he addresses uh, the critiques of Orientalism uh, that he thinks uh, were fair. Uh, basically, uh, uh, the, the, the argument was that in Orientalism, he was able to deconstruct European Orientalist uh, representations of the Orient uh, and Orientals, but he didn't uh, really explore how Orientals uh, represent themselves. That was basically the critique, right? You deconstruct and then it stopped there. So in culture and imperialism, he uh, explores this question of uh, how to resist uh, cultural and linguistic imperialism and how people in 
so-called Orient or the Global South or the tri-continent, whatever term you'd like to use, basically non-European peoples, how they represent themselves and how they resist uh, these dominant and hegemonic and Orientalist representations of them. And so um, language and culture are very important for me and my work. I know this is something that uh, many psychoanalysts are not comfortable with. Um, and they tend to confuse um, what I mean here. But uh, uh, my point is psychoanalysis was invented in the late 19th century uh, in Austria. And the first language that it was practiced in was German. So it wasn't something that is beyond culture and language, right? And however, um, and the, uh, the problem, of course, is uh, when you have universalist claims based on provincial knowledge, right? And so um, I think there are very valuable um, lessons from psychoanalysis that we should uh, pay attention to and think about and see if they apply, uh, you know, in, around the world. Uh, but what I try to do is complexify um, the relationship between, you know, Europe and the non-European world and try to think about, well, how do I think about um, non-European subjectivity, if you will? Of course, by saying this, it doesn't mean that non-European subjectivity is one thing. It's really non-European subjectivities. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the question of culture and language are important because uh, Lacan, you know, Jacques Lacan, um, the famous psychoanalyst, said that the unconscious is the discourse of the other. Mm. Right. So the unconscious is discourse of the other. The question that we can ask after that is which other. Mm. Right. And and this is where I kind of uh, try to stretch and expand uh, psychoanalysis in my critique. So when I critique psychoanalysis, ultimately, ultimately, I want to ground it in a worldly vision so that it doesn't think just in terms of, you know, Europe and just <clears throat> applying this understanding that was developed there to everyone in the world, kind of in a colonizing fashion, the way that, you know, uh, missionaries and evangelicals spread Christianity, right, during colonial times. Um, so what I want to see is uh, really taking the question of language and culture seriously when thinking about the unconscious and the subjectivities of people, especially who are non-European, particularly because their experience, their historical experience has been very different from European people vis-a-vis -vis colonialism, mm. right? Uh, and so um, I'll give you an example. And so in, in decolonial psychoanalysis, uh, I think it has the best empirical example of this. When I interviewed um, <clears throat> US Muslims, 19 US Muslims, and you can see uh, excerpts from the interviews and I used discourse analysis. And so I carefully transcribed everything that was said including even uh, because in that methodology, you even transcribe pauses and sounds, right? Mm -hmm. Just yes. to pay attention to everything that happens and make sure that you can accurately capture it. And of course, it can never be perfect, but you do your best. But what is clear there, uh, you'll see that when you read those uh, excerpts, if anyone reads them, uh, you know, US Muslims talk a lot of, about a lot of things uh, in English and in relation to U.S. culture, but then there's a switch to Arabic, uh, especially in relation to Islam, uh, and a, speak, a switch to other cultures sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's kind of almost like a back and a back and forth there, and so that shows me that there is not one other, there are at least two others at work here that inform two kind of logics, two ways of thinking. And that, that uh, the people who, who are hybrid or, um, you know, people, um, and that's, that's basically the post-decolonial question in, in terms of, you know, hybrid subjectivities um, or, you know, exilic uh, folks, right? Uh, people in the, in the diaspora, right? Uh, is that kind of, you can say it, code switching. Mm -hmm right that happens and uh, what's fascinating about it is that when they speak in english they basically index the war and terror discourse and logic and that's the internalized islamophobia aspect because it 
comes with that language and culture. It's embedded within it. But the, when they switch to like Arabic signifiers, there's a decolonial dimension that's there that has this liberatory potential. Mm. Uh, and and so I, I, I try to do document this and show it, and, and it's fascinating. So this question of culture and language is extremely important uh, in terms of, you know, uh, liberation, resistance, uh, but also in terms of understanding uh, these non-European, uh, non-hegemonic subjectivity or subaltern subjectivities, right? Well, uh, we're picking up on... Uh considerable aspect of psychoanalysis on and I'm just re remembering or putting coming back into Fanon's work mm -hmm. in the belly of French colonialism uh, and his analysis his reading of the question of race and racism and the uh, colonial subject in this one so can we Possibly now think of Said, Freud, Fanon, and maybe also uh, in the moment that we're dealing with this massive eruption of mm -hmm. racist discourse that possibly harken back to uh, the colonial era. And yeah. To see how to navigate the, the contemporary period. Yeah, and well, Fanon obviously is a very important reference for me, and he cited all over, um, actually both books. Uh, um, uh, of course, the title "Black Skin White Mass" really captures that kind of split that I was talking about, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that split that he felt as someone that, you know, grew up in Martinique, uh, thinking that he's French, and then moving to France and realizing that he's actually. Uh, racialized as black and not seen as french mm -hmm. so that of course created a crisis for him am i french am i black where am i and so um this is a crisis that applies to people like us as well um and uh, of course the solution to this problem is not to assimilate but to actually embrace this complexity and and of course uh one of the things that Edward Said talks about, uh, especially in his memoir at the end, he embraces that split. Mm. He embraces being between two positions because while there is suffering in, in that in it, uh, there's no question. So we shouldn't, uh, you know, glorify it or romanticize it, but it allows us to be able to shift position and offer a kind of analysis that people that don't experience that uh, cannot do. And even uh, Du Bois was aware of this dimension when he, when he wrote about double consciousness. Double consciousness, and, yeah. Right? And so um, he wrote about it uh, not just as a curse, but in fact, he said it's a, it's a gift of second sight because the racialized person has two consciousnesses. The consciousness of the person who is racist and how they see them, but also they have a consciousness of themselves, Right? However, the racist person doesn't have that double consciousness. They only see the world in a kind of simplistic way, right? And so there's something powerful about, of course, again, there's suffering, there's something painful about it, but there's also some, it gives us that gift of second sight, of being able to switch. And that I, I think is important for the kind of analysis and the kind of practices of solidarity that we can develop. And I would add also, that the question of racism or oppression more generally, uh, we have to think, and going back to my point about, we have to think about the unconscious, right? Not just consciousness. Mm -hmm. So in our anti-racism, we can be anti-racist on a personal level, but racism will not disappear unless a racist culture disappears, right? Because ultimately oh, as... Yeah. Yeah. You have to yeah, deal as with the a, culture, you have to deal with the materiality. Uh, yes. That informs, so, that shapes, that uh, really puts... And cultures, the... can, cultures can change. Yeah. So, uh, but that's the work that we need to do. It's a, on the cultural level, is, uh, is changing the culture of racism, because ultimately the racism comes from the culture of racism. It doesn't come from somewhere else. And so that's where the internalization comes from. That's the source. So if we are anti-racist, but the culture is racist, uh, 
uh, then we can be anti-racist consciously, but still internalize racism. And consume and that's... racism almost right. 24-7. Uh, if people have questions, uh, whether you're in Zoom sure. or Facebook, uh, feel free to write the question and we'll ask uh, Robert the question. And I see that there's people joining us on Facebook and other places. So, and we'll I'm also... happy to answer questions. Yeah, so feel free to ask uh, your question as we go forward. Uh, now, you mentioned a little bit uh, in relations to where the field of psychoanalysis began. And I wanted to actually ask about the reception of your work mm -hmm. in the psychoanalysis field, but in general in the whole area of psychiatry. And this guy is a predominantly yeah. a white field, not an exception, yeah. because again, uh, the field of academia in general has not yet, it's actually one of, uh, in terms of the numbers and how it looks, tenured faculty and so on. So how do, how's that as a challenge in terms of the reception of your yeah. ideas and uh, uh, where are the nods of possibly hopeful signs? Well, I mean, over the last few years, there have been a number of uh, scholars doing um, similar pushback, um, exploring issues of racism, or um, questions related to oppression and liberation. Um, well, first of all, the the first group that that tends to, I would say, there's both reactions. To be fair, so uh, there are people who support my work who are psychoanalysts and who are psychoanalytic uh, theorists, and, and some of them are big names. Uh, and so there's that dimension. But there are many people also that. Uh, feel uncomfortable about this kind of critique and mm. and but what i see and this is what i hope will change is because a lot of times remember i mentioned that uh on social media people reacting to the cover of my book and just seeing the signifier islam and they have negative association and they don't want to even engage with the book based on that so i mean that's the problem is um that's the kind of uh, struggle that I see is people that have a negative reaction that's immediate, like a gut reaction. Uh, for example, let's say seeing Saeed's name and they don't want to engage. Um, and so they just give up or or dismiss. So those are those people I just tell them, please, at least try to engage with the book, read it, go through it. If you disagree with me, tell me why, but don't be dismissive without reading it. Uh, the mm -hmm. least you can do is try to read it. So the people that have read it uh, or listened to me talking about it tend to enjoy it. So this is um, this is basically the situation. Yeah. We have a question from Muhammad Khan. He says, how do you recommend uh, psychiatrists start studying introduction to decolonial psychoanalysis and use it in their praxis? Or I think maybe in their practice or in their praxis. Okay, so, I mean, when I think about this question of decolonial psychoanalysis, the first key point is we need to see more people in the sci fields, so psychiatry, psychology, psychoanalysis, uh, who are indigenous, who are black, who are from the global south. So basically, we need, instead of having, let's say, a typical uh, white male, Christian psychoanalyst or psychiatrist or psychologist um, work with someone uh, that is indigenous or black or from Latin America or from Africa or from Asia um, who whose first language is not English, whose religion may not be Christianity, who may not be seen as white, um, who may be poor, what have you, right? And so it's important that we have more people in the field, in those fields who, uh, b you know, come from these um, subaltern cultures. And so, you know, as someone from Egypt, I'm doing my part, but there need, I, you know, there's not one person that can do everything. Um, and actually, I'm uh, looking into training um because you know my background is as research and teaching and and uh, uh theory but i'm actually not a clinician but i'm actually planning to train as a clinician in particular to work with subjects 
and and uh, you know analysands or patients uh, whose primary language is Arabic because hmm. uh, you know that's very important when you do this kind of work that you speak the language you don't necessarily have to be from the same culture that could help but it's important that you know the same language because they might be speaking English and then an Arabic word you know is in between what they're saying right and if someone doesn't know Arabic they're going to miss that. And that could be a very important clue. Right? And so this question language, again, is very important. Uh, and so, and it's related to that decolonial move. Um, so basically, uh, we just need more people that speak different languages that come from these different parts of the world to uh, study and train in those fields so they can work with people uh, from their cultures or people that speak their language and I, I think that's that's the direction that I hope to see. We have another question from El Castro, uh, last name. I don't know what that first name is, but he said, how would you view non-Western societies internalizing Orientalist attitudes toward Muslims, i.e. using anti-terrorist propaganda and oppressive policies? Okay, the whole phenomena that in non-Western societies, the same... Uh, internalized discourse of seeing Muslims as part of this terrorist enterprise. Sure. Well, you actually contributed a chapter in a book on Islamophobia in Muslim majority countries. So I think that just confirms my thesis that internalized Islamophobia is just global. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter uh, if a person is Muslim or not, uh, or if it's a Muslim majority society or not. Islamophobia is just a dominant framework around the world. Uh, it's something that everyone around the world is exposed to on a daily basis. And so everyone is internalizing it. Um, and so um, that's something, you know, we have, we obviously have to um, work on and resist in all these different contexts and these different contexts uh, have their specific uh, conditions and all of that. Um, so we have to kind of understand that the internalized Islamophobia is kind of universal and then look at every context and see, well, how does it manifest in this specific context and what can we do about it? In some cases, honestly, it's it's really difficult. As we know, um, without mentioning names, some Muslim majority countries, uh, uh, we know how the treatment of certain uh, Muslims with political affiliations, what happens to them, right? Um so there's a criminalization uh, of of political Islam in general uh, in in many Muslim majority society, and yet when we look at Europe, I mean, you look at Germany, for example. You have what is the dominant party? Christian Democratic Party. I mean, they're not shy to include the word Christian in the name of the party, but if you do that in a Muslim majority country, then it's a big problem. Isn't that interesting? Well, uh, that's the whole discourse of who sets, <laughs> who sets who sets the rules and what is acceptable and what is not. Uh, uh, and in, in here, uh, you're touching on an issue right now in Europe where uh, political Islam is supposedly under a, an extreme uh, type of response from the state. You're talking about yes. France using yes. a whole... Uh, Set, slew of policies uh, that, on the one hand, you could actually bring in back uh, anti-terrorism uh, uh, or counter-terrorism measures uh, to the individual's uh, level, uh, regulating Muslim bodies, Muslim space, uh, making sure that Muslims are, in essence, are used as a targeted community. And similarly, Absolutely. some of our colleagues in Austria uh, the case of, uh, of course. I think Farid Hafiz is uh, Farid Hafiz, yeah. uh, very, very problematic. Uh, so, Yeah, and that's why in my work uh, I talk about, I mean, there's racialization, you know, uh, so racism, uh, you know, based on racialization or perceiving the others through the lens of race as inferior, right? Mm -hmm. Not just as a different race, but as inferior. And but there's also what I call politicization, which is very much applies in the case of uh, the criminalization of Muslimness, uh, especially the public expression of it. Right. Uh, 
because uh, that's really what's a, what's at stake. If you're uh, outspoken and if you express yourself and if you are seen publicly, that's what they're trying to criminalize in many European societies, especially France, right? Um, and um, and ultimately, I mean, in my analysis, because uh, we have to situate this in a kind of historical trajectory that goes back to the Cold War, uh, we especially, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately about the Arab Cold War between mm -hmm. 52 and 79 uh, and that whole conflict between Arab socialism on one side, you know, and the Gulf monarchies and how the U.S. supported the Gulf monarchies and, of course, um, a specific form of Islamism in order to fight Arab socialism, right? Mm -hmm. That, of course, backfired and led to what's called Islamic terrorism that backfired on the monarchies and on the U.S. And this is what we're dealing with today. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand the historical uh, origin of, of this. Uh, and they never deal with it in terms of accountability, their role in funding uh, some of those things and the kind of monsters that they've created over time that are now uh, not just uh, fighting Europeans, but in many cases, Muslims are the victims of so these Muslims terrorist have groups. Muslims the primary victims during both the right. Cold War as well as the post-Cold War. Uh, Absolutely. And again, the, between the Russians and between the Soviet Union and the United States, the Muslim world, the Middle East, was just pawns on a uh, shifting, moving map. And in right. essence, uh, uh, we were the bodies and the front lines for uh, uh, this Cold War policy. And, and you have the famous picture of Reagan uh, sitting with uh, uh, Mujahideen and calling them uh, freedom fighters. And uh, basically, he compared them to the founding fathers of the United States because he was saying that they're fighting the Soviet Union and they're going to build a new country like the U.S. in Afghanistan. I mean, you know, that was that was the language. Like, we, we're acting as if we're amnesic. You know, we, we, we have no sense of history. And we, we just look at this, oh, where did this come from? Oh, there's Islamic terrorism. We don't understand the evolution of different forms of terrorism, including state terrorism. We, of course, don't think about colonial terrorism which is like the big story, right? Um, there's a great article on, on colonial terrorism. First, the colonization of the Americas, but then the enslavement of Africa. But then you have, of course, uh, the 19th century, the scramble for Africa and, and that whole thing in World War One and World War Two, as a result of imperial powers fighting over, you know, all these colonies, right? And because they're fighting each other, these colonies were able to liberate themselves and having the decolonizations of Africa and Asia. Yeah. Well, again, the challenge is uh, as we look at the world and the different modes of engagement and how to, how to decipher anti-colonial or decolonial struggles from mm. instrumentalization of struggles for imperial as well as Cold War, right. clash of civilization, uh, right. type of discourse that are taking place. And that, today, I think there are a lot of people that are just have mixed up all kinds of th strands in there without actually going systematically to lay out the ground and understand what is taking place. Uh, so Absolutely. That's where we are in at this point. But, uh, but the history is very important, and that's why I, I had to talk I mean, about that piece. Yeah, You have to. Without history, you just can't understand what is the dynamics in there. You Absolutely. Know, between Second World War to the 79, uh, the Absolutely. Muslim world and the Middle East was recruited into the Cold War and pushing a particular type of Islamic epistemological construct to rally behind the West in facing the Soviet Union. So you Absolutely. have that dynamic that uh, we're still, you know, uh, uh, dealing with. And that's with why some, some theorists actually claim that the Cold War is not over. I mean, we say the end of the Cold War with the collapse of the Soviet Union, but ultimately the red scare has has been replaced with the green scare so it's just been there's a displacement of the enemy but yeah. the logic of the cold war continues oh absolutely it's very difficult to unwind uh, bureaucratic structures that have been suckled on using the resources for a cold war so it's shifted from the focus on the red menace to now the green right. and the red menace of china so the sino-islamic right. supposed discourse or alliance that Huntington puts forth in his clash of civilization 
And then you have all this uh, displacement theory, this, uh, 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 you know, conspiracy that is taking place. All this feeds from the same type of, env of environment that try to rationalize the world uh, that we are part of today. So right. it's been an, a, really a, a, a pleasure to talk to you. So again, I want to make <laughs> sure that people pick the book. Uh, I will post uh, the announcement and the link on the Facebook and uh, YouTube for people to pick it. Make sure to share it with your friends if you can. Uh, I know we're coming into month of Ramadan and Eid, so maybe you should try to get a Eid gift for some of your <laughs> friends as well. Uh, so right. Robert, it's been a pleasure speaking. No, with the you. pleasure is all mine, and, and Ramadan Karim to you, Dr. Bazian, and to all the listeners. Thank you, and look forward to uh, when things are better, when we overcome COVID, that we'll come back yes. and gather again in our annual Islamophobia gatherings, and yes, still delve forward. into some of those exciting conversations. Thank you. Forward. You enrich us thank you with so your much. presence. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wa alaikum salam. So. Thank you everyone for joining us, uh, for those who joined on Facebook, uh, for those who joined on YouTube or Twitter or any of the other social media, please make sure to share the information, share the material, uh, because that's the only way we can make a difference. It's not a one person, it's a collective effort that would bring transformation. So hopefully collectively we'll bring a, a, a new world into existence at one point or the other in the future. So, salam alaikum.